Welcome to the Neurocritical Care Society podcast. I'm your host, Fawaz Mufti, podcasting from Westchester Medical Center at New York Medical College. Today, we're going to talk about thrombolytics, specifically alteplase and tenecteplase in acute ischemic stroke. Alteplase is a tissue plasminogen activator that is approved for use prior to thrombectomy in ischemic stroke with the goal of reperfusion to ischemic areas in the brain. Tenecteplase is a recombinant enzyme derived from alteplase that is more specific to fibrin and more resistant to inactivation by alteplase inhibitors. Tenecteplase is less expensive, can be administered at a faster rate than alteplase, and has a longer half-life, allowing for bolus dosing. So the question is, in patients with ischemic stroke who undergo thrombectomy, is tenecteplase equal to or inferior to alteplase in establishing reperfusion? Today, Mike Brogan is joined by Dr. Bruce Campbell to discuss the recent publication in the New England Journal of Medicine entitled Tenecteplase versus Alteplase Before Thrombectomy for Ischemic Stroke, which was an investigator-initiated, multi-sensor, prospective, randomized, open-label, non-inferiority trial. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, this is Mike Brogan. I'm a neurointensivist at Regions Hospital in St. Paul, Minnesota. Today, I'm interviewing Dr. Bruce Campbell from Royal Melbourne Hospital in Australia. We're going to discuss his recent paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine titled Tenecteplase versus Alteplase Before Thrombectomy for Ischemic Stroke. Dr. Campbell, welcome and thank you for agreeing to participate in our podcast series despite the time difference. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be with you. Dr. Campbell, first of all, some of our listeners may not be familiar with tenecteplase. Can you give us a little background on the difference between tenecteplase and alteplase? and what some of the theoretical benefits might be. Nectoplase is a slightly genetically modified version of alteplase. It differs by two amino acids, and the result of that is it has a much longer half-life, so it's about 25 minutes versus five minutes uh, for the initial half-life, and uh, that means it can be given as a single bolus rather than an infusion over an hour like we have to do for alteplase, which obviously has some practical advantages, when you're, particularly when you're shipping patients between hospitals and around the hospital to get a thrombectomy. It also uh, is more resistant to one of the uh, thrombolysis inhibitors, PI-1, uh, and it has uh, greater fibrin specificity, which has some theoretical advantages, potentially a reduced risk of hemorrhage. So that's the, the key differences in the biology of tenecteplase. In most systems, it's also a little less expensive than alteplase, um, by about two or $3,000 in the U.S. That's not insignificant. Can you give us a brief summary of the trial design? Sendai-18K was a prospective randomized open-label blinded endpoint, so a probe study, and we were comparing the uh, 0.25 milligram per kilogram dose of tenecteplase versus the standard 0.9 milligram per kilogram dose of alteplase. In patients who are eligible for standard stroke thrombolysis within four and a half hours of onset who are going to have a thrombectomy. So we required a large vessel occlusion in the internal carotid, uh, the first or second part of the middle cerebral artery or the basilar artery. There were CT perfusion scans performed in all the patients, but we, compared to our previous trial, Extend IA, we did not have a cutoff for the maximum core volume uh, that we would allow into the trial. So patients with quite large cores were included. And how did tenecteplase compare with regards to reperfusion, which was, I believe, your primary outcome? The primary endpoint was essentially whether the patient had already reperfused by the time they got to angiogram. So for those who know the TIKI scale, which is our angiographic reperfusion scale, TIKI 2B3 is greater than 50% restoration of flow to the involved territory, and that occurred in 22% of the uh, synecteplase patients versus 10% of the alteplase patients in the median 43 minutes between giving the thrombolysis and uh, taking the picture intracranially. I did not see it in the initial article. It may have been in the supplementary uh, material, but was there any difference in the thrombectomy rates between the two groups? Yes. So for every nine patients that you uh, treat with tenecteplase versus alteplase, uh, one patient didn't need a thrombectomy. So essentially that difference in reperfusion translated in all but one case into uh, not needing to do the procedure. So one in five technectoplase treated patients essentially didn't need the thrombectomy and one in 10 of the alteplase patients. How did the groups do in terms of the clinical outcomes? Was there a difference in functional outcome to follow up? The main functional outcome we looked at, well, the main secondary outcome was the modified Rankin scale, which is our standard functional outcome at three months. 
when we look at the ordinal shift, so improvement by at least one point on that scale, uh, there was a significant benefit of tenecteplase over alteplase. If you just look at the dichotomise, did they reach functional independence or not, there's a strong trend of P equals 0.06, but it didn't quite reach significance. In your discussion uh, in the article, you mentioned that the, the functional outcomes in the alteplase group in this study were less favourable than those in the Extend IA trial. What are your thoughts on why that might be? Extend IA was a bit more selected, particularly um, we had to have independent pre-morbid function prior to the stroke, and in Extend IA 10K, because we were primarily interested in the reperfusion outcome, we allowed people with some degree of pre-morbid disability, um, a ranking of three, which means they might be living at home but needing assistance with cleaning or cooking or finances or something like that. Um, so those patients are never going to get back to an independent functional outcome. We can't make them better than they started, unfortunately, but there are also this issue I mentioned of core volume. So in Extend IA, we restricted maximum core volume to 70 mils, uh, whereas patients did not have that limitation. So there really are quite different populations uh, between Extend IA and Extend IA TNK, chiefly around the, the pre-morbid disability and the core volume, which are very strong prognostic factors. How do you think that clinicians should interpret this study uh, in light of it being designed as a non-inferiority study for the, for the primary outcome, although you did look at superiority. We designed it as a non-inferiority trial because of those practical and economic advantages of tenecteplase. We felt if we could convincingly demonstrate that tenecteplase was at least as good as alteplase, then why wouldn't you use it if it's easier to give and cheaper? As it turned out, we did also show statistically significant superiority as well. I think for this population of large vessel occlusions, there's certainly a good rationale now to use tenecteplase if you want to. It's not uh, approved for, for stroke, obviously, and that's something that we'll have to look at in the future. And at the moment, the guidelines haven't been updated to reflect this either. So it is an off-label treatment. In Australia, we are continuing to do trials with tenecteplase. We have uh, a trial in non-thrombectomy patients. We have the Extend IA-TNK Part 2 trial, which is looking at uh, the 0.25 milligram per kilogram dose versus a higher dose that was used in a Norwegian trial people might have heard of called Nortest. Um, Nortest used 0.4 milligrams per kilogram, so a significantly higher dose, but still less than the myocardial infarction dose of tenecteplase, which is about 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. And they showed similar efficacy and safety to alteplase, but it was a very mild stroke population. Uh, for those who know the stroke scale, the NIHSS, their median stroke severity in that Nortest trial was 4 compared to 17 in Extend IATNK and all the thrombectomy trials. So really not applicable to this population of patients, but we hypothesised in this next part of our trial that if anyone's going to benefit from a higher dose of tenecteplase, it would be those with a large vessel occlusion. So that's what we're currently specifically testing. You, you actually, in that answer, got to the meat of the, my next two questions, as it turns out. Is there anything you'd like to add in terms of how, even though this trial was only for patients eligible for thrombolysis uh, with large vessel occlusion, how the trial fits in with the developing uh, evidence for tenecteplase in ischemic stroke as a whole? Sure. The trials that we've got so far, we had the original Haley studies, which basically did dose finding and suggested that maybe 0.25 milligrams per kilogram looked good in that analysis, and that was followed by Mark Parsons' trial in Australia, which I was involved in, where we looked at a group of patients that actually had large vessel occlusion, but that was way back before the days of thrombectomy. So these patients were just treated with tenecteplase versus alteplase. And in that large vessel occlusion population, tenecteplase was clearly superior both for reperfusion and for functional outcomes. So I think we, we now have two trials, albeit that first one was rather small with only 75 patients, but two uh, New England Journal trials that show that tenecteplase is better than alteplase in a large vessel occlusion population. So since then we've had the ATTEST trial which was done in Scotland um, that didn't have the imaging selection um, and if you then go back and look at the population within a test who had large vessel occlusion they're very similar results to the Parsons trial and uh, NORTEST which I mentioned had that very mild stroke population but a very large trial by stroke standards of 1100 patients so useful data nonetheless. So really, at the moment, there are two trials comparing alteplase versus tenecteplase in the non-thrombectomy population. There's the TASTE trial in Australia and Taiwan and around the world, UK as well. There is the um, ATTEST-2 trial in mainly in Scotland and the UK. 
and those trials hopefully will report in the next couple of years and really give us solid evidence one way or the other about the broader stroke population. In terms of the thrombectomies, as I said, we're doing a dose comparison of 0.25 versus 0.4 and I'd really like to to get that question answered because, as you may know, in, in stroke thrombolysis with elder players, we've had a question about is 0.9 milligram per kilogram the, the best dose to be giving for the 20 years that it's been around, and it would be nice to start off with a definitive answer to that question for tenecteplase. Well, I know that this trial created a lot of conversation in my home institution, and uh, several uh, folks I know we've been waiting for the trials for tenecteplase uh, to to come along to change care. Um, I don't think we're quite there yet, but it sounds like we're getting close. I'd agree with that. I think it would be really nice to see some guidelines around uh, the data that we have and the data that we're going to get in the next couple of years and eventually licensing, although that's obviously something that requires commercial involvement. And there are there are now um, some commercial involvement in Tenecta plays in the North America, so I believe there will be a trial probably in the extended time window with tenecteplase uh, in patients predominantly getting thrombectomy, I think, is the plan. So that will be interesting. That will be FDA regulated, and hopefully that will, will lead to some licensing changes if it's successful. Well, I should just mention the safety aspect of things because, obviously, it's great to open the artery more, and uh, it's important to have improved functional outcomes overall, but everyone does worry what was the symptomatic hemorrhage rate. And the extended IATNK was actually remarkably low. There's only one patient out of the 101 in each group uh, who had a symptomatic hemorrhage, so about a 1% risk. So that was that was very gratifying. These are obviously severe stroke patients who would generally have a higher risk of, of hemorrhage uh, than other groups. So the safety profile does look very encouraging. I appreciate you adding that information as a as a neurointensivist who takes care of these folks who do have symptomatic hemorrhage after lytics. Uh, that is definitely uh, worth thinking about. Again, I, I thank you for your time. It has been a, a pleasure, and uh, I appreciate you making time in your busy schedule, uh, given the difference in time zones, to chat with us. Absolute pleasure. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening to the Neurocritical Care Society podcast. The NCS podcast is produced by the Neurocritical Care Society, whose mission is to promote quality patient care, professional collaboration, research, training, and education in neurocritical care. Our production staff includes Josh Levine, Mike Brogan, Romani Ballou, Storain Shepard, and Benjamin Miller. Our senior producer is Jim Siegler. Our administrative staff includes Sarah Memon and Becca Stickney. Music by Lee Rusever under Creative Commons license. If you like our show and want to know more about us, check us out on Twitter at Neurocritical, Facebook, or LinkedIn. The NCS podcast is available at NCS On Demand, iTunes, and wherever you may listen to your podcasts. I'm Fawaz Al-Mufti and thanks for listening.